Then you get into macro summer. Macro summer is when the economic machine starts firing up again. And that lends, lends to another acceleration in markets and growth whilst inflation is tends to be falling or subdued. And that's a really lovely period because you can make money in pretty much everything. Commodities go up, gold goes up, small caps go up, crypto goes up, tech goes up, everything goes up. And that's where we are now. And so that summer period, the real footprint usually accelerates around the US election and after it. And that's when most markets have their best performance. So there is a seasonality around elections, which you tend to get strong first half of the year or first part of the year. Then it tends to be a bit more sideways, which we had in tech and we had in crypto and where the rest of the market started playing a bit of catch up. And then you get the acceleration that goes on for the end of summer straight into uh, macro fall, which is 2025, when really the best gains come of all. So that's where we are. So back then, we were just starting. Now, what happened? Crypto went on a massive tear, then had that sideways consolidation. Tech had a massive tear, had a sideways consolidation. The rest of the market's now catching up. And the next phase is the money shot. The acceleration that happens around the US election years, and this happened every time, is, is what I refer to as the banana zone, um, where everything goes bananas. And in crypto churns, the charts just look like bananas standing on end because it, they just go vertical. Because around the election period and the year afterwards, they all have to refinance, what, $10 trillion of debt? The Fed has not been able to ref uh, the Treasury has not been able to refinance easily. So it's been issuing short end bills, which is basically a holding pattern for rates to come down. Wait for rates to come down and then you can refinance your rates. It's like you don't want to refinance your mortgage at highs. You want to refinance your mortgage at lows. So you keep your money in a money market fund, which is basically what the Fed did. And then they'll do that. So that period of massive liquidity tends to debase currency. We're seeing China coming out with the cowbell, more stimulus. The US has started the rate cut cycle. That's going to come down a lot. The EU have started. The UK have started. Everybody started. And so the big game is at play. Rising markets that's creating more capital, that's flowing into technology, that's driving technology. We've got the fastest pace of technological change in all human history. And the central bank has taken out the big risk to the downside. So suddenly... The data tells you to become an optimist. It tells you that we're in secular trends, particularly in tech and crypto. So even though they're volatile, every low is higher than the last. And when you look back, they've outperformed everything. Even though you've had that volatility and you're like, why was I so stupid? You know, really, I could have just bought NASDAQ when I started my career and I'd have done much better. But the narrative is so alluring around the the macro collapse mm -hmm. and the fear keeps so many people out of markets. And there's a whole bunch of people on X who've made a whole living out of the fear of collapse. And I know you've been caught up in that in the past. And that fear of collapse stops you investing. It stops you buying a house. And look what happened. Your future self did not thank you, your past self, because you missed it all. And I've done that. You know, I didn't own equities at yeah. all. And yeah. when I look back, you're like, what is stupid? Mm -hmm. But I didn't really understand. I didn't really understand what I know today. And now we've got all of these forces working together, this hyper acceleration of technology, global central bank liquidity that's forcing stuff up over time. Um, and then the fact that they've taken away the largest side of the risk of markets and the inflation bogeyman is just a bogeyman. He just exists in the dark places of your mind because it's very difficult to generate inflation in this world. They will tell you that, well, now the latest story is, well, obviously, you know, every year there's a different story why energy is going to go to $200 a barrel, why it's all going to come to shit and why inflation is coming back. Every year is a different narrative. Now it's like, well, it's the AI data centers. We're going to run out of electricity. It's going to be infinite demand for power. And oh my God, this is the most inflationary thing. They'll be wrong again, as they've been every single time. Liquidity 
really comes from central banks and governments. Welcome back to Crypto Insights. In this video, we will bring you the key insights and main observations from Raul Powell's latest interview. Before we continue with the highlights, big shout out to Gemini Crypto Exchange, our new partner, one of the most trusted and secure platforms in the crypto world. Make sure to check the link in the video description for a nice sign up bonus and for supporting the channel. Let's take this journey to the next to the next level together. Time is money, so don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space. Putting money into the system. So th we have something in the US called Fed net liquidity. So what is the three component parts of that state level liquidity? Well, that's driven by the Fed balance sheet, quantitative easing. They're still tightening, but they've l reduced the amount of tightening. Then we have the reverse repo. And that is a uh, basically where banks mop up all of their funds. So if that's very big, money's tight. And when they start taking the money out, it goes into the banking system. The other side is the treasury general account, which is the checking account of the government. Now, if they've got a lot of savings and they're not spending it, which is where we are today, then conditions are tight. But once they start writing checks, what happens is that money floods into the system. And that is a kind of a net increase in money into the system. So if you make more of something and it's in abundance, it's purchasing power or its value declines. So it's not that necessarily you and I get to borrow money more easily. It's not that. It's that there's more money around and it debases currency. It's like this magical thing that happens. Now, on the private sector side, the stuff like M2 growth and private sector credit growth is kind of a function of that. But they both work together because you can create dollars in a euro dollar system. You can just create them out of thin air by being a bank. And so what happens is there is this huge increase in money that happens. But we as people don't generally get it. Sure, your, your, your mortgage rate may fall a bit, but really it's this debasement effect that happens that's more insidious that we don't see and don't really understand. Asset prices take off, but our earnings don't. So therefore we get poorer in terms of the assets we can buy. And an asset is just future deferred consumption. If you buy gold today, your expectation is you can sell it in the future at a higher price to protect your purchasing power. But today, you can buy less gold than you could a month ago, and less gold than you could five years ago, and less go because your wages don't go up mm -hmm. in the same as these scarce assets that move because of debasement, which is, is devaluing the purchasing power of money by 8% mm -hmm. a year, which is the increasing global liquidity. But most people don't understand it. And so what happens is you have a savings account, you think you're doing all the right things, and suddenly you still can't buy a house. Mm -hmm. And you still don't buy much, you know, you, you can't buy as much, many shares of Tesla as you, you wanted to, and you still can't buy as much gold as you wanted to. And you're like, why? I'm saving money, I'm working hard, but I can never get up the ladder. That's what the basement's about. So we've got debts rising because we're just servicing debts on top of servicing debts. We've got population that is aging and shrinking and productivity because too many old people is not there. That's our problem, right? That's the existing problem. The answer is the everything code. Just keep printing money and just keep kicking the can down the road. And over time, you will lower the value of the debt in percentage terms versus GDP. That's the hope. But then something happened. Something happened that was a miracle. AI came, which is the biggest technological event in all of humanity. I think it's the same or if not larger than the splitting of the atom. Of all the human inventions, this is the defining moment of humanity. What AI has done has changed everything because now knowledge, which was a scarce thing, like you pay for a lawyer, you pay for a doctor, you pay for an accountant, you pay for an expert. 
has now become infinite mm. and basically free. It's the, it's an, it's a deflationary nuclear bomb. But what is an, what is AI? Well, it's a human mind. Let's say it's exchangeable for a human mind, a robot exchangeable for a human body. Amazon already employs almost more robots than humans now, and that'll keep going. So what you've got is infinite humans. Now, so that's the population growth part of the equation. Holy fuck, we've just gone from slowing population growth to, oh my God, in a few years time, it's gonna go infinite. We can see the AI and the robot scaling to billions and billions and billions. If you listen to Elon Musk, all of these people, they're talking about, well, there'll be a billion humanoid robots by 2035 or 2040, whatever the, it's like people don't understand the impact, the economic impact of infinitely scaling human ability.